Um, our speaker today is Sarah Sadwani. I never even asked you how to pronounce your name, but I'll let you pronounce it yourself. You got it, you're perfect. <laughs> I'm gonna admit somebody here. Um, she is an assistant professor of politics at Pomona College, specializing in politics and race and ethnic, pol and ethnic, ethnic politics. Her research interests include voting behavior, elections, public opinion, public policy and interest groups. She has published in some of the most prestigious political science journals in, and as well as the Washington Post, Vox and New York Times. So take it away, Sarah. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, for having me today. And many thanks to the entire uh, Mount Baldy area uh, chapter for having me. It's a, it's a great honor to be here with you today. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and I have a short presentation uh, that I put together for you all. And I will finally present and hopefully you can all see that. So I wanted to talk a little bit today. I figured I would start by sharing a little bit about myself to you all. Um, I, uh, I was asked to share a little bit about my research, which focuses on Latinx and Asian American voting patterns. Um, I thought I'd share a little bit about my motivation for how I came to, uh, to this area of research, in particular talking about some of my work around immigrant uh, turnout, voter turnout. Um, if there's time, we can talk a little bit about vote choice as well, um, and I'll explain the, the difference between those two. Certainly, I think following the, the recent election, there's been a lot of talk in particular about the Latinx community um, and the extent to which the Latinx community was in support of Donald Trump or in support of Joe Biden. Um, I think there's some... some um, perhaps false claims that have actually been put out there to some extent. Um, so we could certainly discuss that um, if there's time. And then of course, I wanted to take some time and talk a little bit about the California Redistricting Commission, um, which I was selected to serve on um, this summer. And I know that the League of Women Voters has for a very long time been um, in support of the, of the Citizens Redistricting Commission and, and the, the movement for uh, independent redistricting. So I very much appreciate that and, and very happy to be here with you all today to share uh, a little bit about what's happening with the 2020 Commission. Okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually a recent uh, uh, newly minted PhD. I received my um, PhD from the University of Southern California in 2019. It was when I finished. You can see a picture of me here at graduation um, with my family. I uh, have three young children. Um, so I was, was able somehow <laughs> to, finish, to finish my studies um, while also raising a family. Um, but prior to uh, academia, I had spent a number of years, almost a decade, working in social justice organizations here in the Los Angeles area. Um, I worked, for example, particularly in immigrant rights. And so I worked, for example, at CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which is also very much involved um, in the redistricting process, as well as the California Immigrant Policy Center. And so it was really doing this work where I, I got my grounding um, kind of in, this, in, the, in the study and understanding of, of immigrant communities, particularly here in California. Um, and so that's, that's really a part of kind of what, what uh, led to my motivation to, to um, pursue doctoral studies in political science. And in particular, one of the things that's most interesting to me is demographic change. And I'm sure living here in California, we're all very much aware, right, that the face of the United States is changing. Most certainly we've seen that happen here in California. Um, so I have a, a number of, of quick graphs uh, just to, to share with everyone. Um, probably these are things that you've seen before. Um, but what we know is that particularly since the change in, in uh, immigration policy in the 1960s, what we've seen is an expanding number of minority communities, both in California and across the United States. And so what this graph is showing is that uh, uh, by 2065, right, we can anticipate um, that the, the number of people of color uh, will surpass the, um, the number of whites so if we look at them in total. Um, and in particular, we'll see that there's rising levels of Latinos and Asian Americans in particular. Okay. 
uh, Asian Americans, right, are projected to become the largest immigrant group. So even surpassing Latinos um, as, as the number of foreign born in the United States by 2065. So here we can see this projection. This data all comes from the Pew Research Center. We can see that by 2065, the number of Asian immigrants uh, is projected to be about 38% of all immigrants in the United States. Whereas for Latino or Hispanics, uh, it would be about 31. So we can anticipate then that there's going to be a, a significant change um, in the demographics of the country. Certainly here in California, we've already seen that. California is already considered a majority minority state uh, in which the, the percentage of people of color um, I outnumber the number of whites. Okay. In addition, right, um, we also know that there's a, there are a large number of younger voters um, who, who are a part of the electorate today. We saw that millennials have become an, a, a massive um, voting population uh, within the United States, and Gen X, uh, excuse me, Gen Z, um, uh, the younger the, the younger cohort, college students today, for example, um, are continuing to. Um, uh, become new voters and are, as we've seen over the last year in particular, are becoming extraordinarily active. Uh, and so, so these younger voters are, of course, bringing, um, bringing with them a whole set of, of new issues that they're interested in, things like environmental policy, for example. And so we know that the electorate is becoming more and more diverse. And so again, this is really my motivation for studying Asian Americans and Latinos is that we recognize that the country is becoming more and more diverse. Um, and, and therefore, we need to better understand the kinds of patterns of behavior that we might be able to find amongst these new immigrant communities, right? And so here, this graph is really showing that in 2016, was, it was the most diverse um, electorate that we've ever had. And of course, I'm sure once we update this um, for the 2020 election, we'll see a, a continuation of this pattern with more and more people from various um, racial and ethnic backgrounds uh, joining the electorate. Okay. My motivation to study Asian Americans actually came from a number of places. Of course, I spent time working at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, you know, thinking about the kinds of, of barriers that Asian Americans face um, in, in terms of political participation, as well as other facets of life here in the United States we really saw uh, Asian Americans come more into the political narrative in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. Obama, of course, spent time in his childhood uh, living in Indonesia. His sister is half Asian. Uh, and it was his campaign that really did a, a, a strong concerted effort uh, to Asian Americans having, for example, an, an AAPI task, White House task force. And uh, so one of the pictures here, I think on the, on the left is, is showing um, members of that task force meeting with him um, in, in the White House. And, and so one of the, the key questions that came out of that time period was, would the presence of an Asian American uh, candidate on the ballot stimulate Asian American voter turnout, right? So there was a lot of questions about, well, wh to what extent are Asian Americans actually a voting block? Do they all vote similarly? Uh, Asian Americans, of course, are an extraordinarily diverse um, diverse community with uh, backgrounds from many different uh, Asian countries, uh, representing multiple languages, cultures, religions. Uh, and so it was really in 2008 where many of these questions began to, to take off. Of course, in political science, there had been a number of people studying Asian Americans for quite some time. There had been uh, surveys and other, a few other studies that had been done um, since since about the, the mid 90s, um, it, it, beginning to study Asian American voting patterns. Um, and one of the, the narratives I think that had been found was that Asian Americans aren't very involved in politics. Um, of course, here in California, if we're following you know, current elections or even current candidates or, or elected officials, we'll know that Asian Americans play a, a very important role um, uh, in, in 
in California politics and have for quite some time. But at the national level, right, there's still an ongoing question about to what extent Asian Americans might form a voting bloc for one party or another. Um, and in particular, I wanted to ask the question about Asian Americans um, voting together for, uh, for an Asian American candidate, right? There are many examples of this, for example, in Texas, uh, in the Congressional District 22 of Texas, there's actually a very large Asian American population. This is a, a, a region on the suburbs of Houston, and there's a, a, a sizable Asian American population there. Um, there's been a candidate there for both 2018 as well as 2020, Sri Preston Kulkarni. And so, Ultimately, what I'm trying to understand is when a, an Asian American runs, will it stimulate Asian Americans to go and vote at a higher level, right? So not simply who do they support, but will more people, so to speak, get off the couch and go cast a ballot? Okay. And so I use these kinds of races to better understand whether or not that's actually occurring when an Asian American runs. And so in this instance, we can see in 2016, um, the Republican incumbent Pete Olson ran against um, a, a Democrat, Frank Briscoe. Both, however, were, were white Americans. In 2018, so we, it, it, you know, it's hard to know to what extent um, Asian Americans would be having an increased level of turnout um, when there's, when there's um, you know, when both candidates are of the same racial background. 2018, however, we saw Sri Kulkarni, who's Indian American running, and, and he in particular said, said this, when I first started, I was told not to bother with the Asian American vote because they don't turn out. He went on to run a campaign in which he was engaging voters in 23 different languages, spending significant amounts of time, um, you know, meeting people in community centers, going to various kinds of uh, Asian American festivals and, and um, 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 places of worship, et cetera. Uh, Kalkarni actually ran again this year in 2020. He didn't win. Um, he lost uh, again in 2020. Um, there's actually a whole backstory to that about uh, some of the diversity within the Asian American community, particularly um, between Hindus and Muslims in that community, which we could talk a little bit more about later um, if that's something of interest. But uh, you know, recognizing, of course, that Asian Americans are very diverse. I wanted to make sure that in this, in my study, when I when I conducted it, um, that we would be able to really look at the distinctions between different national origin groups, right? For example, some of the candidates here in California represent the vast array of Asian Americans. Evan Lowe, for example, is Chinese American. Madison Nguyen um, was Vietnamese American. Rob Bonta, Filipino. So I wanted to make sure to craft a study that could allow us to really understand the differences between these, these diverse communities. Um, actually, let me go back here and talk about one other piece. In the past, when studies such, a, such as these have been done, they've predominantly looked at African Americans and Latinos. Typically what has been found, so in other words, what that means is uh, when an African American or Latino runs, will you see an increase of voter turnout amongst black voters or amongst Latino voters? Okay. Typically, what has been found is that at these lower level elections, Congress, State Assembly, the answer is actually no. <laughs> uh, no, there's not a specific turnout, except in those districts where there is a large number of, of uh, voters of that community in the district. So in other words, as the percentage of a, of a minority community rises, it's under those circumstances where, where we see a rise in voter turnout. This can ultimately be an important piece that we might, you know, that one might consider when it comes to drawing district lines, right? So this is kind of how, it, how my research to some extent connects um, to the work of the redistricting commission. In this study, 
uh, I specifically looked at uh, California State Assembly districts, and I used the California statewide database. That's another key piece as it relates to the redistricting commission, because the California statewide database is the official uh, voter database for the state of California, and it's what we'll be utilizing um, when we redraw district lines. So I've spent many years uh, utilizing this database and understanding how it works, and I'm hoping that that will will serve me well over the next over the next six months as we begin our process to um, redraw redraw district lines. In particular, what's what's notable about the statewide database is that it identifies six Asian American subgroups, the largest six in California. It uses surname matched vote returns. So in other words, identifying surnames that uh, that align with various uh, national origin groups. Um, um, and identifying voters that way. Okay. What I found, okay, I'll skip kind of to, the, to my findings here. Um, what I found is, was, was kind of interesting and, and really the first study of Asian Americans and voter turnout. Similarly, similar, excuse me, to African Americans and Latinos, I found a similar effect for Asian Americans. So in other words, when I aggregate all Asian Americans together, meaning, meaning Asian Americans of any background, so Chinese, Filipino, Vietnamese, Indian, et cetera, when I put them all together in a group and any Asian candidate is running, what I find is that there is a positive impact on voter turnout, similar to how we would find for African Americans or Latinos. It's in those places where there is a large number of Asian voters where we see this turnout effect, okay? So in other words, Asian Americans follow a very similar voting pattern to Latinos and African Americans when they're all lumped together. However, we know that Asian Americans are of course very diverse. And so I wanted to break them out and take a look uh, at turnout um, turnout by their national origin groups. Now I have a lot of numbers up here. I don't expect you to understand all of them. I'll walk you through it. Ultimately, what I found is that each group behaves quite differently. So on this slide, I have Chinese turnout, Indian turnout, uh, and Filipino turnout. Okay. What I find is for Chinese Americans, I find no effect at all. And that's interesting because Chinese Americans are actually the largest group of Asian Americans, both in California and in the nation. So when there's a Chinese American on the ballot, there's no real impact. It doesn't stimulate more people to go out and vote in support of a Chinese candidate, okay? So you, we see this here, there's no stars, okay? For Indian turnout, kind of something, something extraordinarily interesting is that there's a huge rise in turnout when there's an Indian on the ballot and it's regardless of the of whether or not of the number of Indian Americans in the um, in the district. Okay, so regardless of how many Indians are in a district, Indian Americans, I see this huge turnout effect. Okay, so that actually makes them quite different from African Americans and, and Latinos. For Filipinos, however, uh, as well as Koreans, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, I see that their pattern mimics that of Black and, and Latino, okay? That they have that same turnout effect, but it's based on their, their, um, their district demographics. It's based on the, the, the size of the, uh, of the community that's there. Oh, perhaps I lost a slide here. My apologies. Um, so ultimately I found that Koreans followed that same pattern as Filipinos. Japanese Americans followed a similar pattern as Indian Americans as well. And unfortunately, at this point for Vietnamese Americans, there weren't enough cases to actually study Vietnamese American turnout um, to, to find a, a reasonable result. Okay? So certainly there's, there's more work to be done here. Okay? So these findings, uh, you know, I, I took these findings and wrote a piece recently this past summer uh, in the Washington Post's Monkey Cage relating this finding around Indian Americans uh, to Kamala Harris and her election as the, or her, uh, you know, her selection as the vice presidential um, candidate. 
And I, I, I said that because of this finding that we found that regardless of the district that they live in, Indian Americans, we see this major turnout effect for an Indian American candidate. This means it's highly likely that Indian American voters um, are going to turn out for Kamala Harris in a big way. Um, and so from that piece that I wrote uh, in the Washington Post, I've had a, a lot of interest uh, in this idea. There's actually a lot happening in the Indian American community right now. Um, some of you might remember um, about a year ago, the prime minister of, of India, um, Narendra Modi came to Texas and they had a large event called Howdy Modi in which Donald Trump appeared on the stage with him. And it, many, many thought that perhaps it would signal Indian Americans turning to the Republican Party. Um, we don't know that for sure yet. Um, I actually have a survey that I just, uh, just pulled out of the field with a colleague from Wellesley College in Boston, specifically um, uh, surveying the, the attitudes and opinions of Indian Americans. And so we'll learn a lot more about where Indian Americans stood um, this, this election and, and to what extent um, they supported Kamala Harris. I'm going to stop talking about my research here um, and and talk a little bit about the redistricting commission. I can still I do have a number of slides still about about vote choice if that's something of interest to folks. Um, um, but we can always come back to that at a later point. Um, I didn't I didn't prepare any slides on the redistricting commission per se. Um, so I'm going to take uh, take it off of. Um, sorry. I will stop sharing my screen at this point um, and just go back into speaker mode. A part of that, you know, a part of a part of the reason I didn't prepare any slides is we're still very much um, in the in the early stages of the commission. We're very much a part of, uh, you know, been setting busy setting up um, our operations. Um, for the commission, hiring staff. If you've been following the commission, you might have seen some of our recent press releases. We've just announced the hirings for our executive director, our chief counsel, um, our communications director. We are hoping to bring on um, a, a uh, assistant deputy director, excuse me, executive deputy director, um, I believe was the title. Um, and we have a number of additional hires that will be coming shortly. So I wanted to back up and talk a little bit about what the commission is. I know that the League of Women Voters has been very much involved in the creation uh, of the redistricting commission. So I'm sure that there are some of you here um, who know a lot more about the history of the, of the commission than I do. And I certainly welcome your expertise as well. Uh, the you know, redistricting is a process that takes place every 10 years. Um, so after a national census, uh, every state has to go back and redraw their lines. And one of the things that will happen at the federal level is a process known as reapportionment. So we'll take a look at the full census of the entire United States. Each congressional district must be of, a, of approximately equal proportion. So as we see shifts in population from one state to another, um, some states might earn more, might gain uh, additional congressional seats, and some might lose congressional seats. It's uh, certainly expected that California will likely lose at least one congressional seat because we've actually begun to see a decline in our population. Certainly also the, uh, the extent to which the census was conducted as full as possible and as many people as possible were counted will be another factor uh, in reapportionment. After we have that reapportionment information, it's uh, upon the states to, to redraw district lines to ensure that, that the districts are approximately of, of equal population. Uh, California, unlike most other states, removed, took the, the power of that redistricting away from the state legislature. So in most, most all states, the state legislature uh, retains the power to draw those lines. And of course, that means whichever party is in power of the state legislature, they will have the, the upper hand uh, when drawing those district lines. And of course, that's how we arrive at, at uh, Jerry, what, you know, what is often referred to as gerrymandering or partisan, partisan redistricting. So California was unique uh, in 2008 um, with the Voters First Act, which was on the ballot. Um, 
and removed that, that power from, from the state legislature. Uh, and so the commission will be responsible for redrawing all of our congressional district lines, uh, as well as the, the 80 members uh, assembly, the state Senate and the board of equalization. Um, this is the second, only the second uh, commission in California's history. Uh, so we certainly have big shoes to fill. The 2010 commission was largely seen as very successful. There were several legal challenges uh, against the maps and ultimately the maps drawn by the 2010 commission were all upheld. Um, so that's kind of a little bit on the, on the, on the background of the commission. Um, you know, I don't know if folks have questions at this point, if they want to jump in. Um, I certainly I can talk a little bit more about the commission and the, the, the workings of it, but um, I'd be happy to take questions at this point if, if that's comfortable for you all.